Hey guys, welcome Hello. back to Wandering into Wellness. Uh, today we have the lovely Laura Kyo, uh, scientist at Oxford University, um, conservationist and activist. And uh, we wanted to talk to Laura specifically um, for the work that she's doing at the moment uh, in relation to um, how sustainable is our global food system and, and like where are we, like what's, what's the best avenue that we should be taking with all the news that's out there that, you know, shouts from every corner, but there's no voices in the middle to give us this balance and this sense and a science based approach to it. Uh, everything seems to be, unfortunately, all the science that we're sold to is marketing company science. So. Um, yeah, we just wanted to kind of speak to you to get that balanced voice and to understand a little bit more of like, where should we be going? Like, what what is, like, what's the the, the proper direction for for human health in terms of diet and planetary health, and how do we how do we balance them? I suppose. So big questions. So to yeah, start. real easy. <laughs> <laughs> really soft, yeah, softballing you know. it. I think they call it. Yeah. <laughs> no. Let Let's start maybe. <laughs> let's just take it back. Let's start at the beginning. And how did you? end up in this avenue how did you get to here what made you interested in this yeah um yeah i mean it's interesting because i grew up uh kind of in the suburbs and i never really spent much time in nature i'd like i genuinely thought ah nature when i saw like a cow in a field <laughs> like i thought that was genuinely the romance yeah. yeah it's like ah the wild <laughs> <laughs> And then um, my dad got a sabbatical to go and um, work from Australia for nine months. So the whole family went to Australia when I was 12 and lived there for nine months. And we went to the Great Barrier Reef. And it was like before the major bleaching events, right before the first big bleaching. And it was just like, I actually have shivers now just thinking about it. It was glorious. Like, mm. like, yeah the strongest acid trip you can imagine, <laughs> but you're sober and you're just looking at this amazing, yeah. So after that, I was just like, my mind was completely blown. I was always interested in, um, we had a little dog and I used to always wonder like, what's it like for her? Like she's this little ball of consciousness. Like, what is that? So it was kind of like wonder at the world and then also what is this like what are we what like fundamentally what is this thing like what's going on and were, um, were your family like intellectualizing those questions as well or was this you no. solo just going off on the fringes yeah, yeah i wonder because like no my brother is like a businessman my sister's really into mental health okay. but me yeah i don't know what it was but that you started kinda asking those questions made me go that direction um and I didn't really think, like, growing up in Ireland, I didn't really think about conservation. It just didn't hit me that that could be a job. So when I was looking at, like, what to study, I ended up doing psychology because there was a load of animal navigation stuff and animal cognition, and I was just really fascinated by all that kind of stuff. And then halfway through that, I, um, <laughs> I um, did this weird thing. It was like before the Irish recession where everybody was just traveling everywhere and it was like the high times. <laughs> like, yeah. And so I volunteered in this animal refuge in the Amazon and I spent three months just with a puma. Wow. <laughs> in the Amazon. Just the one puma? Yeah. Oh, wow. And because um, these were like rescue animals. Okay. Um, basically from terrible places like the Tiger King places oh, like that God. or from yeah. like awful pet scenarios. The Puma I was with, her mother had been poached, so she was quite young. And so they didn't want to like kill the Pumas. They couldn't re-release them. So they kind of built these big enclosures in this park. And then you just go and walk a Puma around all day in the Amazon. And by walking a Puma... What On a we, lead. like really Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And was that Puma must have been a pretty friendly Puma by the end of it all, was it? Um, yeah, 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 she was lovely. Yeah, wow. I mean, she bounced on you sometimes. You never go to a <laughs> lower. On you bounce meaning death, but yeah, okay. <laughs> sometimes she bounced, and her two her two balls would like cover your eyes like a weird, <laughs> terrifying kind of a prank. That's hilarious. But she never put her claws out. Like she's like, guess what's coming next? You're like, yeah. I don't know. I don't. Please. Yeah. Death <laughs> or you, fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the place is called Into Wari Wariyasi. So like I W Y. I can't remember the website, but. Um, yeah, it's still open and it's still amazing and ridiculous. Um, but never sit like downhill from a puma. Okay. But anyway, that, um, no, that's a great lesson. That's, that's a, a yeah. just, take that, away. That's the take away. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Forget change your diet. This is actually practical. practical. Yeah. Practical Laura advice says to survive in the world right now. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. never <laughs> sit downhill from a puma. That's yeah. brilliant. I mean, it's kind of obvious. Like, if you have a cat, they do like pouncing from the wolves, sort okay, of. Yeah. So you're just giving them all. They're like, he's just like, oh, yeah, this is too tempt. much fun. <laughs> yeah. Don't tempt him. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. But it was one day just sitting like in this rainforest, and it just really hit me like, ah, oh, like this. This is what I like. I want to protect this place because. There, there was a load of deforestation happening around the boundaries of the park and, you know, like deforestation in the mm. Amazon, it's fairly yeah, well known anyway. And it just really sorry, hit what? home. Topic? Sorry. <laughs> There's trees? They're no missing? No. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, Glyn. Let's reverse back a bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That we need to start with that. So thing. when well. agriculture began, yes. <laughs> we needed the land. <laughs> um, yeah, so it was like halfway through psychology degree where I was like, ah, oh, no, yeah, this, this the world's falling to pieces. I can't be messing around with animal con consciousness yeah. and cognition. Yeah. They're going extinct. So yeah, so that's what kind of made me then go that direction. Um, and when you say that direction, what was the next thing you did? What was your, what was so your then, step? Um, yeah, so then finished the degree anyway, and then found a conservation master's in Edinburgh. And, um, th but you needed a biology degree and I'd never really studied biology, so I wrote to them and I was like, but I lived with a puma for three months. He literally did that thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, we were sold. I mean, like, I've got utmost respect for you now. I was like, I know about the rainforest <laughs> and big cat behavior. Because <laughs> it was like conservation and wildlife management um, okay. was the masters. So they were like, yeah, OK. Grandeur. <laughs> <laughs> Little I did you know like, it was the perfect thing for your resume at the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember renting books on biology just like so I wouldn't be behind yeah. and being really stunned at like that thing about all these vegetables coming from the brassica plant <laughs> like broccoli, cabbage, brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, all, like Single so plant. many yeah. from one plant. Yeah. Never knew. Anyway. <laughs> um, Amazing. And then do we still eat that plant? Brassica. I don't know because it's called the Brassica like family the Brassica, now. We don't yeah. we don't actually have like we don't a have single plant called the Brassica anymore. No, I, I don't know which one is closest either, honestly. But I know when you get to like if you look at like for instance, we have like like kale plants behind us and broccoli plants behind us, and they both basically look the same yeah. at a certain point in their life. And at some point, one turns into a stalk with tiny things, and the other one gets this like little flowery head on top. Yeah, you've seen them because you grew lots as well. Lots, many this year. <laughs> and so I guess it kind of seems like it's going to be, you know, the way everything is like grown for more fruit these days. Yeah. So it was probably used to be lots of tiny little flower things. Yeah. This is a wild guess. Oh my god! I mean, who knows? Somebody correct me if I'm wrong here. Okay. I like the way that you're talking I'm as like, if you're the authority. No, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm no, no, right. <laughs> no you, it has to be. That has to be right, yeah, though. No, from the one book I rented. <laughs> <laughs> and my little from knowledge my of growing three plants in my garden. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, hilarious. No, yeah, commercial okay. horticulture is in the background, but, like, there's no way. We ain't the experts. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so, so that was your... The biology became fascinating. Um, well, that well, the bit. Biology, <laughs> that you you sidestepped the biology and yeah. went into conservation <laughs> yes and then yeah so then did that masters and the, but then the recession was really hitting like there was zero jobs i think out of that conservation class only maybe three people got jobs and they were the ones willing to move anywhere and do anything mm. and i was really lucky because i got this job studying chimpanzees in the republic of guinea um yeah and so then moved out there and um lived in this in this little village in guinea guinea is like then anyway i don't know what it is now it was the sixth poorest country in the world and so um it was out uh kind of in a village you know with mud huts um no electricity no toilets going out every day studying chimps and these chimps like they were not in a protected area they were not they were just sometimes they'd be quite close to the village um so it was really they'd never been studied before in this whole region Wow. yeah and and we didn't want to habituate them because maybe hunters would come in and so we didn't yeah. want to like get them killed so we were putting up camera traps and kind of trying to avoid them avoid there any the, oh, yeah. you're you just we're like away. no we're just voyeurs like <laughs> don't look directly at us um yeah huh. and so the, uh and, the, and then yeah we um we were out one day and um, the kind of the chief of the village was one of the main guides 
Like, it's so stupid. Like, I'm this stupid kid with a master's and I'm somehow leading this group of people <laughs> that, like, know the area, know the animals, know everything. And it's just such a terrible, like, white colonial weird thing. That's where academia gets oh, you, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, weird, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um... But uh, so you're this, like, yo ho, into the jungle. You're like, not that way. There's a thorn there, and that you know, like, oh, sorry. You should have like my clothes are like completely ripped up, like because it was all these thorns, uh. and like I was just using duct tape, and all the guys somehow were like magically like moving through. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, just the innate knowledge of that. Term. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and another woman in the group, she uh, was from the UK, Lucy Deverne, and she'd studied chimps. She'd done a lot of filming of chimps, so she was also quite graceful. <laughs> I was like, always Destroyed. at the back, always like, <laughs> like trying not to eat. fall over. <laughs> yeah, Funny. and terrible at spotting stuff. Like, I, I go blind with excitement. Okay. Do you ever get that? Like, when your eyes move... So fast. So f my eyes would keep moving, like someone would see something and I'd just get too worked up and not, I'd be like a terrible safari guy. Okay. Or Anyway, but this one day, um, this chief of the village and this like absolute master guide who could find chimps like kilometers away, he was just like amazing. He noticed these little markings on a tree and he was like, oh, I think this might be chimps. And I was like, what? And he eventually like had to like, <laughs> like, oh, really? Okay. And some of the other guys in the group, like from the village were like, nah, it's probably wild pigs or it's probably kids or whatever. They were just like scrapings off the bark of the tree. Um, but me and Lucy anyway, were like, well, this guy's a genius. So let's put up a camera and see. And um, we came back to collect the camera and uh, we found like this ridiculous clip of this chimp ambling up you could tell it was a male chimp because you can see like huge balls they have massive balls right. um and he ambles up to the tree and he grabs this big stone and he does a pantoot he goes like hoo, 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 ha, 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 and then he like flings the stone at the tree and we were just like what, what? <laughs> The dog is trying so, yeah, to speak. Yeah, he's pretty chimp. much. Uh, he's like, <laughs> I know like, what's going on. I know what he was doing. Hang on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, it like it had never been recorded before. They'd never heard about this before. Amazing. Everybody was kind of like, ah, what is this? <laughs> and then we started seeing it because once you know what to look for, we start seeing the signs everywhere. We start seeing all these rocks with pieces of bark. We start like, and so that was this really funny like discovery thanks to this guy of this completely new chimp behavior wow. and, and but, but he didn't know about that behavior either like no. they'd never seen it even yeah. that happened in no. years no he just had a hunch like yeah spooky and so th this is a bit of a city because i know it made headlines for all the wrong reasons right <laughs> yeah and this is the thing that i was like before it's like i want to talk about that she's like it's not about that <laughs> so explain to you what it's not about and then what it is about <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Well, we f we found it and we were like thinking about what the hell is this and um, there's a number of different um, so that so well we were part of a bigger project that spanned chimpanzees range in Western Africa so everybody started looking for it and we found it in a couple of different regions right and um, one theory is that what they're doing is they're communicating long distance so chimps will often drum on the roots of these like large buttress trees. And they'll drum like in a Morse code, which is crazy. It's crazy that people don't know about this. And they'll actually communicate from long distance with this drumming. And then they'll end up meeting like in a spot at a time. Like they're actually, it no seems like, way. yeah. Amazing. And this was published like in the 90s. Um, now it's not definite, but like that's what there's it drumming. And then be. there's, yeah. So, um, so it could be, there aren't many trees in this region with large roots. So maybe they're using the stone to like travel further to, you know, oh, to communicate yeah. long distance. Um, I loved your patois, by the way. Patois? No. Oh, pantu. 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 Not pantu. Sorry, that's an amazing thing. I didn't, I didn't even know it was called a pantu. That was a, a beautiful pantu. You Did, should give it a go. Like, it's, it sounds Maybe at crazy, the end but, you can yeah. give us like a little lesson on how to, <laughs> to do it. Maybe that would be good. <laughs> For an outtake. It's yeah. satisfying to do. I believe it. Um, so it could be it could be communication or it could be like landmarking the kind of border because chimps are territorial. So it might be like they have these marks. The interesting thing is that the stones would pile up at the base of the tree. So it's like one of the first 
records of archaeological evidence outside of humans. And so, and the, archeolo the archaeological record of it looks quite like human sacred sites. Okay. So what I wrote, because I wanted to write like a blog on the discovery since I was there and give credit to the guy that really discovered it, who wasn't even included as a co-author on the paper or who's like, you know, completely kind of left out of the whole scientific process. So I thought it'd be nice to just give the story behind the discovery. And then I wrote kind of like sarcastically, really like jokingly, you know, but that doesn't come through in text. Obviously, I wrote something like maybe I, I wrote all those explanations and then I wrote or, you know, maybe this is the first sign of spirituality in the wild. It's like, oops. <laughs> and I should have known what would get picked up. Like, I, yeah. And it just went crazy, like front page Daily Mail. Like, do chimps have religion? This crazy scientist thinks so. Like, and then quoting that one line from the, like, they never contacted me. They were like, most scientists would be really careful about making such claim, but not Laura Kyo. Oh, no. <laughs> and like, quoting me, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Oh, and I'm, like, doing my PhD at this point, having a heart attack because, like, I want to get a job, and now I look like a lunatic. Oh, no. And that, but, but it was really annoying, too, because it's also, like, we do constantly underestimate other species, like yeah. we constantly... And undermine the intelligence, the potential. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so it was like, on the one hand, no, I don't think this, but on the other hand, chimps have been seen like swaying in front of waterfalls, doing this funny, like, n it looks like awe of nature thing or in front of big thunderstorms. And Jane Goodall has talked about oh. these observations. And so I just think there's so much more going on in other species than we can ever access mm. and and we kind of science cut all that out because it was like well if you can't measure it if you can't then you're just a highfalutin you know it's like it's a theory we made things thing, really or? cold and clinical unnecessarily i think because the world is amazing and mysterious and science should be able to go in that direction but we're also paranoid about appearing like mad hippies <laughs> as i did there you go, there you go yeah but i still have a Living job proof. So, there you, you there know, know, it can work out. you can um, be like laura <laughs> but it was really so it was like this really difficult um juxtaposition of like no i don't think this but we can't rule it out either yeah, like it's very yeah. unlikely but who knows what it is we don't know what it is yeah um, and like I did a podcast with a guy um, I can't remember his name now but it was like for NPR for different radio stations oh Jad Abenrod or that guy or no. one, of, one of that gang but the NPR gang anyway I think it's played on NPR but I think oh. he sells to like 300 radio stations oh, wow. it was a really he was a really big guy and the podcast was like with Franz Duvall who's like a brilliant um, animal behaviorist cognitive, like one of my heroes oh wow I think Jane Goodall was like clips of previous interviews with her was in it Barbara King another brilliant woman who I love her work and then he interviewed me and he was putting it all together for this piece so I was like okay like gonna clear my name okay. and then he edited it in a way that just made me kind of look like a lunatic again. again I was like yeah I just dug deeper <laughs> it's hilarious you're like I can't possibly seem insane because all these other people are just going to put a beautiful context yeah. and no he just drops and you no, off the it was like beautiful context beautiful context here's this renegade this lunatic <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, oh. oh dear that's funny so it never really um, got resolved like I did a story collider do you know the story collider um, they do these like stories from scientists okay and so I did a story collider like podcast on it where I could like tell the story <laughs> like try from and... my own words. Yeah. <laughs> but like it's and just even so that was taken out of context. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so funny though because even today, like yeah, if you Google me, I think that's still I don't know. That's I think that's still the number one. Probably oh, that's so terrible. So. <laughs> yeah. So since then, <laughs> you've been like getting down to brass tacks and more like what you like is more relevant to like planetary survival stuff and, and less behavioral stuff or like how how did where did you um, go from there yeah that put me off the behavior <laughs> understandably well i mean that whole project wasn't even about behavioral stuff it was actually just about mapping out chimp territory and figuring out where because there's a big mining company where could they mine that wouldn't like mess up the chimps habitat so much and how could we plan it in a way that would be least damaging okay um so that was actually what that project was about 
Uh, and was the mining company working with you out of interest or were they like... Yeah, so they were, okay. um, yeah, it was a collaboration between them and the Wild Chimpanzee Foundation and okay. the Max Planck Institute um, in Europe. So oh, yeah. it was like a kind of a mishmash of a lot of different things. Wow. It's really interesting working with miners because like, I think as environmentalists, we have this real like, oh, Us versus them those thing. filthy yeah. miners. Yeah. It's like, well, we're all buying the stuff. Mm. so. Although since Guinea, I haven't bought new electronics because I've seen the bauxite mines. And it's like, no, they're secondhand. Secondhand is just fine. Okay. Um, yeah, like, a th so Guinea is really, really resource rich, even though it's incredibly poor. Um, is it the world profits a lot okay. from, from Guinea bauxite to make aluminium. Oh, um, bauxite. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I think there was other mining around too, but the main mining in the area that we were was bauxite. Mm. And it just looks like Mars, like really? they just level it. Yeah, it's, I still even get flashbacks like if I see tin foil. It's, just really? like, it's terrible. Jesus. Yeah, that was, yeah, it's really. That's violent. Yeah, we should all it be is violent. To it though, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Is there a version of, it's something I wondered about recently. Is anybody looking to build like a sustainable mobile phone or like, is there, like, is it possible even to do that? Do you Didn't think? Didn't people try and then they had to shut down? Oh, God. That's I probably think, probably the truth. But yeah, I don't. yeah. Uh, but like the thing is, we have so many. Like, there's so many second phones. They mm, all work fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, there's even websites that sell them that like guarantee them for a certain amount of time. So, like, I just think we have so many. How many phones exist now? There's probably seven billion. I'm sure there's more than the amount of people yeah. probably yeah. at this stage. Yeah. So it's like yeah. the whole sustainable phone thing. The whole just new stuff. I just don't yeah. think new stuff. Just upcycle, recycle. Particularly yeah, needed yeah. anymore. Recondition like, stuff. Yes. Yeah. We're working in that direction. But I don't. I also don't want to give the impression that like we all need to be out looking for secondhand phones and that will solve it because we actually like it needs to be solved at a far higher level than individual mm. consumer choices. But we still need everything at the same time. I just don't want to like give the impression that it's just an obsession with like my own individual choice like yeah, 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 i spend yeah. most of my time thinking about system level change and how governments could do better or how the european union could do better and so that's like my research okay yeah. um it's tough not to overemphasize so, yeah. one or the other though isn't it you end up coming off kind of on one branch or the other off i know and then everyone keeps fighting about like yeah because they're they made us make it you made us want it <laughs> 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 no it's true and there's this really big thing about like shaming people mm. and people are so stressed out and they're just like trying to pay bills and have a decent life and they're trapped in a system that pushes us in that direction yeah. it's a lot to ask to try and like make it put it on their shoulders yeah like it shouldn't be it's sh like i just think we need a revolution basically like we need a really big shift in how we actually see our part in the world. And if mm. we don't have that, then the destruction will just barrel on mm. out of control. And how like, do you stimulate that type of like revolution, as you're saying, like that type of like mass sea change, do you think? I know you like nobody has the actual answer answer here, but like, you know, how does that happen? <laughs> but, but you know, at a level that doesn't like you're saying just become a very confronting thing that makes people kind of shut down because like oh it's just too much mm. to take when they're trying to deal with just the the crises of their daily lives and and trying to make the best life they can for themselves their family blah 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 yeah i mean i think it needs to come organically in a way i'm not sure it can be um driven from outside sort of thing i'm not sure like anything i can say right now can, can help well we better stop <laughs> <laughs> no but like i just think that um i think it needs to come from people's own discomfort with how things are and i think i do think it's a shame that we've put things in boxes like these are the environmental issues these are the social issues mm. these are the because it's the same colonialism exploitation model that's causing all this havoc mm -hmm. like that's causing all this awful uh, inequality that's driving the whole thing like we have this i hate the idea that it's humans inherently being an issue for 
the planet because humans are sound actually like the vast majority of people i know are sound even the miners were lovely mm. but it's like the system has been built and there's so much momentum in the system and we've created a system where psychopaths do better and therefore psychopaths kind of create the rules and so we're all in this false competition when we don't actually realize that collaboration that that like even this year it was so clear why would the economy collapse if we're all just like taking it easy and feeding ourselves mm. so the economy actually relies on doing stuff that damages the earth mm. like what and why are we still all okay with that economy like yeah. i just think that we need to fundamentally sort of question how do we get here how has this whole thing been set up and how do even our own minds kind of contribute to that because we've been raised in this mindset of sort of domination and control like even just the garden like apologizing for the garden being a bit wild like I know. oh i'm sorry i'm not controlling my garden to the extent that's now socially acceptable yeah. it's so weird like we have this real kind of um control thing and i think if we just step back and had to think about the fact that we all only actually care about well-being about having some well maybe we all don't but like about a bit of free time a bit of leisure mm. and just like the, the the things that make our lives a little bit comfortable but mm. we're trapped in this system of like oh no 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 like bigger house bigger car more security uh, I'm kind of rambling, but no, not at all. It's such a, it's such a kind of a. I just hate it when it's like humans because it's not humans. We have indigenous people in local communities that are doing amazing stuff and always have, to not screw up the land they're living on. It's only when a specific group of humans decided, oh, I'm gonna like treat the earth like a resource to exploit to the max. Oh yeah, and I'm also gonna treat those other people like the same resource to exploit. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to create this system of bullshittery that just Feeds builds itself on itself and, it, yeah. and gains this momentum. Mm. Because obviously, if you dominate and control, you keep spreading out, you keep dominating more. And that's where we're at. Like, mm. it's a really good book, The Patterning Instinct by mm. Jeremy Lent. And he talks about the kind of cultural history of humanity and how it kind of came about with this idea, this separation of humans and nature. Um, and built from there of this sort of dominant controlling mindset that's so inbuilt in us like um it's so like the first bit is kind of figuring out okay what do i really want and then moving from there in a in a yeah because i also think that like i kind of think fundamentally it's about trauma like people are just traumatized I mean you can see it Trump mm. is traumatized like mm. and it's easy to hate these people but fundamentally I think it comes from a messed up life where they didn't get enough meaning or belonging or love or you know and and it and therefore they need to control and dominate just to feel a little bit safe mm. and then loads of people feel unsafe feel fearful and they also go on this buzz of like ah oh, have to I don't, that's kind of how I see it, but it's yeah, no, I think you're tricky to right. explain. But it's the same. I mean, it's the same as anything. I think it, everything's become kind of boxed into these little things. Like we were talking about this the other day. It's like you're vegan or you're an environmentalist or you're a conservationist or you're someone who doesn't care about that stuff or you're into child welfare or you're into, you know, looking after women's rights or you're looking into the divide between white and black and there's no like it's as if these are all just completely separate issues mm. that don't relate to each other in any way and we're really good at going well this is my I'm just going to go on this issue here without realizing like these are all the issue all of it <laughs> the mm. whole thing is the whole issue and how we look ultimately at the world and at ourselves and how we relate to the world and the environment we are in that whole thing has to fundamentally change and that's the same with our food systems right like how yeah. we're eating now how that is it's a little bit what you're doing as well policy around that kind of business or looking at agriculture in general 
Yeah, I mean, what I'm doing right now is um, looking at uh, trade policy um, and the European Union and how they're thinking about agreeing to a trade deal with Brazil and other uh, Latin American countries and how that would be absurd because Brazil is deforesting basically as much as they can and Bolsonaro is actively promoting that. Mm. So um, the, the research now is kind of showing how this trade deal would be a disaster, how it doesn't have any of the mechanisms in place to actually protect local communities, indigenous people, the planet. Um, and so just the absurdity of it and then giving mechanisms that have already been thought of, like, but kind of summarizing them in a framework that this is what could move things in a, in a better direction. Because EU, like the EU has a huge amount of power economically, but they're not using it, but they could. Like the, Bar the Paris Agreement, we keep making these big global commitments and then just not meeting the targets. Just ignoring them like, like two seconds later. Celebrating yeah. the commitments and then just carrying on. Mm. But trade could, could provide that leverage point so that if countries aren't making genuine progress towards the Paris commitments, then no deal, no trade deal. Okay. And so it's like we need to like make a playing field where in order to be a successful business partner, you need to actually meet your commitments. Yeah, accountability basically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And because there's so much money tied up in trade, it might be a way. But it's kind of naive too, because it's like, well, everything's still all about economic growth. So how realistic is this? At the same time, though, we have like social movements and a lot of pressure on European politicians. And so it's like it's possible. But will it happen? And um, is, the, is the initiative. So when you say Bolsonaro's like, you know, not even ignorant to it, but like actively looking to, it seems, destroy the habitats that are they're like the foundation of their country's culture or whatever. In the EU, is there a more humane approach to that? Like, are you are you hearing voices within those you know in those rooms where those deals are being hammered out where people are actually looking to put those checks in places in place or is, is it people having to shout at them like yourself to to make sure that's not happening like do you know is it, does mm. it seem any like inherent will to do that you know yeah i mean it's a mix like last year i published a letter um with 600 scientists and the support of organizations in brazil that represent 300 indigenous groups and so because that was like European scientists, indigenous groups coming together to call on the EU and um, that got some press coverage. And then that got me a meeting with the European Trade Commissioner at the time. And that was a really interesting meeting because it was like trying to feel out like, yeah, you know, are you smiling and nodding? Like, do you like where where are your real priorities? And just trying to like speak to without being patronizing, like, what are you like what are you actually going to care about mm. what's your legacy going to be like because it was her last term and it's like you could really shift this bef you could be like but she's the pioneer yeah. in and then a month later they just agree to the trade deal without any clear mechanisms whatsoever so it's like but also like did you know maybe she did try maybe maybe, tried, yeah. maybe it's just the system is so there's so much pressure on on economy at all costs that mm. it's still really hard to do and yeah. um, so it's a good question i'd say it's mixed like there's definitely people at the european commission pushing for this yeah are there any there's heroes or any names any good people aren't enough of them um anna cavazzini is an mep with the green party and she's brilliant she's cool. done really good work um sonia guajajara is an indigenous leader in brazil and she's just amazing the stuff she's calling for and what she's doing um, so yeah, there are there are a lot of really good people working on this, mm. um, but it's just when will it be enough, right? Like when will that be the better option? Clearly, yeah. Like to me, it's already. Like how clear does it have to very, be? Yeah, it's like <laughs> yeah. well, this is the thing. Yeah. Like, how many times do we have to be smacked on the head with like? I mean, I learned about climate change when I was in school, like at sixteen. And I just remember it being really, really shocking. And just like, why isn't everyone panicking about this? It was quite funny because um, I thought thunder started going off as the teacher was like, <laughs> but it was just something bringing out a really big roly bin. But like, I was like, ah! <laughs> It's the full pathetic fallacy in the background. <laughs> yeah. And then God spoke unto them. Imagine if they time it that way. I know, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. I mean, like that is the way to treat climate change right now. Teach it even. <laughs> but like, <laughs> that's brilliant. But and it's like we've known since 
the kind of the seventies. Definitely known since the eighties. The Rachel Carson situation, etc. Yeah, it's on, like like sixties, seventies. It's mad. And obviously, indigenous people have always known. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just talking about as the their really home began to shrink. Slow shrink white people. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like how much? How much do we need to like suffer before we get it? That's yeah. it's really like, come on. How close to home does the suffering have to get? Yeah. Really, isn't it? And to I keep us. yeah. yeah. And like people keep thinking like, oh, it'll happen when it really hits us. But then look at the US, like one side of their country is on fire. The other side is flooded. It's underwater, I know. Yeah, yeah. It, it's perverse, isn't it? I mean, when you say that, it sounds insane. Like it just doesn't sound like that. Like how, how could you not be alive to the concerns at that point? But I think yeah. what happens is though, these things happen, these really alarming events happen. And people do start to panic and they do start to go, oh, gosh, well, actually, maybe this is the thing that, you know, mm. that we've been talking about. It's, it's right here. But there's always enough voices, loud voices that come yeah. through and say, no, actually, you know, the polar ice caps aren't actually melting that badly. And actually, it's going to take years and years. And so it's fine. And because people don't want to be terrified, they latch onto that. Well, well, I, but that one person said that. And then they go, oh, okay, phew. Mm. Yeah. Panic no, it's, over. It's too easy to do. Like, you almost have to say, like, okay, we're going to shut petrol stations for a week and let's just see how people do, yeah. do you know, and then kind of give them an idea. OK, well, how would things work if, like you were saying, when like the economy was like necessarily shut down for three months and there were people were like, the economy is tanking. We're like, but actually, but people kind of had enough of their stuff. They just weren't buying fresh More new TVs or yeah. whatever it was like. And like maybe that's that's been very glib because I know there was, a, there was a lot of actual proper trauma going on in people's lives during that. Yeah. But it seems like we, yeah, I don't, I, I just, I can't in my head because in our daily life in the shop I run it's like most of the people are coming into us really get this thing and everyone's quite panicky about it everyone really wants to make change people are you know bringing in things to refill and and have been doing for like 20 and 25 years yeah and that's what kind of what you're saying as well it's been around for so long this idea mm. like the mass change it's just very tricky to understand like it obviously like you say it has to come from governmental level because obviously all these individuals making their own life choices we still need to do it but it's not actually the thing that's going to flip the switch ultimately yeah. or it doesn't feel like it. It yeah. needs to be like a pincer effect. But we saw how like it was possible when, when lockdown happened and all these changes had to be made that we would have thought were impossible last year. Work from home, you mm. know, grow more food, all these different things that you were like, well, people would never accept that. Mm. People do accept it because there's enough fear about this illness that we could die. But we can also die yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if the environment Much more likely to die, is actually. destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's not a like, do you die? Maybe mm. you don't and you do. This is a like, no, everyone will die yeah, situation. Yeah. So like, how do we... Everyone will die. Did you just say that out loud? Well, I guess that's, that's the reality of it. That's I mean, I mean we're going to die anyway. Yeah. Everyone's going to die. Yeah. Everyone will die. <laughs> Unless we figure out cryogenics right at the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, right before the... <laughs> <laughs> just in the nick of time. <laughs> Phew! Yeah, we weren't immortal. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Lydia said, everyone will die. How dare you? It's going to be the say, headline. She's scientifically Yoga accurate. Says. Yeah, 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 exactly. Thanks, yeah. Laura. <laughs> Spoken from the lady who said chimps are like, I don't know. Clarify. God. <laughs> right it back. Um, Sorry. So, but, so what then? Right, we are capable if if the government makes decisions that seem radically huge and change our way of life massively. We actually all just adapt. Like yeah. we did it, hmm. we are doing it this year. Yeah. So what needs to happen? What are the? I just, like I think that um, I think that that's why I'm stuck on the social movement because if you I mean if you look at big changes over history, it's it's big civil unrest social movements that will often shift things mm. quite fundamentally. Mm. So that's a really big one. I think being involved in whatever movements you agree with, being active with those and building them, um, I think is really important. That's one bit. And social movements that aren't about telling people to recycle more, like ones that are really focused at the system level. Um, I think that's one really big part of it. I think the other thing is like, we're so used to kind of trying to strategize with our rational prefrontal cortexes. And I think that strategizing mind is also sort of in a weird way, part of the problem. Cause it's like the thing that's trying to control and, and, and break things apart and move from like the logical mind instead of the heart. Like, cause at the end of the day, it's sort of about love. Like it's about love for the planet, love for each other, 
love for like whatever this mad thing is that's life like it's it's because all those movements that you mentioned before um you know women's rights black lives matter all the different movement like it's again it's about supporting each other it's about mm. coming together it's about not being in competition mm. it's about things like equality so i just think that it doesn't mean that everybody needs to be like for everything i think it's fine that people are still doing like working on the things that they're most passionate about that they most link to because at the end of the day that's that's what we need to build like that those linkages the community like the thing that scares me a lot is this kind of slide towards authoritarianism and that's and that's it's like the slide further down the control domination path and so anything that gets us more towards community collaboration sharing soundness <laughs> general good. soundness just don't be a prick yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it yeah. no but so like simple. i just think that um we kind of saw that with covid too like all the support was from communities it was like from the connections that we had or the connections that we build and so the kind of framing that like oh the government the government aren't actually going to just magically stand up and do something like they need to be pushed or they need to be dismantled mm. and i think that actually anyway elected government i'm not sure i really am a fan of anymore mm. like it's just so prone to corruption so prone like we see like study after study when you get into power you might just misuse that power mm. like I went to collect, I used to do woodwork and um, I went to collect a table that I made like from my secondary school and the teacher, and I was like 22 or whatever, you know, and the teacher was off getting it and um, he told me to just look after the class while he was gone and they were doing an exam and the power, like it immediately <laughs> went to my head and like I could see two people cheating. And like I used to cheat in tests in school. Like what but do I care? But the other side of the fence. I should have respected. I should have laughed. But instead, I was like, you know, I can see you. Like I said, it's like <laughs> the right. worst teacher. You can hear your own voice. You're like, I hate myself doing this. Yeah, yeah. not yeah. during though. During okay. I was like, this feeling is feeling great. Okay, yeah. yeah. Like later that day, I was like, what? I just did that. <laughs> what was that? Like, That's mad. And I just think that like we're prone to that. Mm. So I really think that maybe governments should be decided by things like citizens assemblies by kind of like jury duty like random selection of of the population and then you get representation by definition mm -hmm. and it's random so you don't get power hungry people all the time and it's not prone to corruption because you have a higher changeover mm. and you do you know you can have scientists and experts available for advice like independent scientists and stuff so there's less of sort of corporate involvement yeah. but how do we get there so i think like going more towards um putting the responsibility on citizens assemblies is a really good step so i think politicians also don't want to some of them do want to take strong action but they're a bit scared because then it's all on them if what happens doesn't work out yeah. so it's a good excuse for them too to kind of say okay we're going to set up a citizens assembly and then we're going to go with what the people actually want so I think that's like a really good thing to push for and a really good um, thing that Extinction Rebellion has, has kind of been championing in fairness to them. So yeah, I think there's a lot of different ways. I also think it's really unpredictable. Like Greta Thunberg, she like genuinely did not expect anything to come out of her sitting outside with a sign on a Friday. She, you know, but she just felt like she had to. And I think people being a bit more bold, doing stuff that they feel like they have to, instead of going along with what they've always done, is like one of the best things. So I don't know what that would be, but yeah. like I do get the feeling that it'll be some kind of spark of somebody doing something a little bit mad, and then it like building, people yeah. realizing like yeah, and it growing exponentially yeah. from that. Because I think so many people are unhappy in their lives, like. There's so much loneliness, depression, anxiety, and it's again, it's all a symptom of the same. We've just set up this terrible system mm -hmm. that wants to exploit rather than support. Like so. Yeah. yeah. Cool. That is 
that's actually much more of a toolkit than I expected to be having. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, when I asked you that question like 20 minutes ago, it's, what do we do? You've actually kind of answered the question. <laughs> wow. But like genuinely, like in a, in a, like a you know, step by step yeah. way, citizens assemblies, yeah. more direct democracy, essentially, you like not trying to put all the onus on, on politicians to make all the changes because they can't or they won't or whatever. Mm. Uh, and then putting the self checks in place for, for, uh, for industry as well. Yeah. I think like, I think we also have to not get bogged down on what we're against mm. i think that idea and i've done this a lot myself but actually rather than that really pushing towards what we want mm. and creating a better vision because like i really feel that so many people just have this really dark outlook on what's to come and i can also have that but like if we all agree that things are going to get terrible then they are yeah, yeah so yeah, yeah. like yeah. we need to kind of Last year, um, I, I had this dream, right, where I was at a climate strike um, and there was this character in the distance and I went closer and I was like, what's that? And it was a guy in a green Santa suit and the climate strikers were talking to this new like green Santa about what they wanted for the planet for Christmas. And it made like global news, like cool. there was this whole new character and it was amazing to hear what kids actually wanted to see rather than what they just wanted to stop. So it was a whole cool. new way to cover it. And I woke up, I was like, oh, that's actually a really good idea. It's really good so, Yeah, we set up like a Green yeah. Santa's Grotto on Grafton Street. Yeah, I, Street I was thinking, I was like, but I, but I heard about this. This, this <laughs> happened, I was like, her dream came true. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was I like, did. oh, I'm so tired, but we have to do it. <laughs> so me and some friends, thank God for them, like I wouldn't have been able to do it without them, uh, set up this grotto and, um, and we were going to get loads of press coverage. But then that woman that was in ISIS flew back on the morning of the Green Santa's Grotto. Uh, and all the photographers that we had booked went out to photograph her covered in a blanket getting off the plane. Like a nothing. Yeah. Green Santa guys, come on. I know. Damn, damn. So, so this year I'm like thinking about, because I do think that's a really good idea for it's getting, it's a lovely for, idea. for like changing this sort of. Yeah. But it's also like we're much, we're much, more likely to feel great about ourselves if we're going towards something that we really believe in yeah. and then we're also much more likely to stay committed to that thing and continue to buy into it if we're feeling good about it yeah. if it's motivated from fear like fear is a great motivational factor it makes us do a thing but we feel really crap about it <laughs> and about ourselves and then ultimately yeah. that's a bad self-fulfilling pro yeah. prophecy so if we can like actualize and manifest this thing of like well what is it that we really want and what is this future that we see yeah. why does it have to be worse than the one that we're in now why can't we go well what are the things we want to change and how does that actually look like yeah mm. and i and it's funny because i don't think people even really think about it like mm. even take the time to actually imagine that and and see what it would be like and it's really interesting like because the science is terrifying and it's terrifying to see that yes we keep going in this direction even though we have all these warning signs but then you see like social tipping points can be really sudden and mm. really unpredictable. Um, like I've been working in this stuff for 15 years and it's just like banging your head against the wall. But then the past few years, there's actually seems like real shifts in, in people mm. getting mm. active on it and really genuinely making efforts on it. So, and that couldn't have been predicted. Like everything always seems obvious when it happens, mm. but before it had like, I mean, the you phenomenon with Greta Thunberg, it's amazing. It really was unexpected. Yeah. Um, so still, it's like, it's still open, still yeah. a wide open game, you know? Um, yeah, and I think that yeah. hope is such a, that, that is such an important thing, isn't it? That hope, because I think a lot of people are just going, well, we've heard all the statistics. We've, we've heard that we've only got, you know, 20 minutes before the whole world dies. And then, oh, well, we're not doing it in 20 minutes. So, OK, we won't do anything then. Let's mm. just carry on as we as are. As we and pass hope more that, deadlines. Like, yeah, 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 we'll yeah. just hope that everything's fine and yeah. la, la, la. Whereas if you get told, you know, if that's pointed out to you, we're like, well, actually, massive change can happen really instantaneously. OK, OK, so there's hope. So now what? Now yeah. how do we move towards that? And just like you said, it's coming from that place of love as opposed to that place of fear or hate or negation, mm. basically. Yeah. And it's like your dream. It's like it's creativity, imagination. It's those like those thoughts that come out of nowhere. Those are the things that we have to like 
make space for them to come mm. through and like in that yeah. kind of fear-based mindset that just doesn't kind of happen yeah. Yeah. it's like when you're brainstorming you're not thinking about well, if we don't make this new idea, we'll go bankrupt. You're like, no, <laughs> that's, not, that's not the thing. You just like mm -hmm. sit there and like blue sky thing and let it sort of start mm -hmm. to, I don't know, come up and like do it with people, make it community based because brainstorming on your own is no fun. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like the other idea that I had that I'm happy about came from completely from just procrastinating and just chatting with a friend and then realizing like, ah, oh, um, we were looking at all the trees that we've lost globally and we've lost half of all trees we used to have before we like invented the axe wow. and i was just thinking like christ like how many trees is that and then divided it by how many people and i was like no oh, it's only 400 trees per person so set up this thing 400trees.org we have christmas gift certificates great <laughs> and, um, it's only Good plug we were like, actually, plugs like that it's kind of cloudy now yeah, i could stop being a no distant shades. bastard yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um and planted like 150,000 trees so far and they're wow. in um, agroecological they're for restoring degraded farmland in sub-saharan africa so it's really good because it's like the people that are being screwed over by climate change are actually getting some ways to be able to farm when Great. as climate change is getting worse for them so they're trees that won't be cut down yeah. you know for because they're actually providing for people as well wow um yeah and hopefully taking pressure off the natural areas because people can live off their own land again. That's exciting. Um, That's amazing. It's only 50 quid for 400 trees. Like, it's mad. What? Um, Christmas is sorted. Because the farmers are planting them um, with trainers. So it's just a really low cost program. It's literally just there's loads of volunteers involved as well. And um, that and then the trees are looked after like for free because they're on the farmer's farm. So it's just the cost of the of the actual saplings. Amazing. That is amazing. Yeah, I know. Yeah. We, we have to do something with wondering about trying to get people involved in that. Some amount of people, without a doubt, four hundred yeah. people to plant four hundred trees yeah. each. Yeah, amazing. And because it's, it's, I mean, it's very doable here as well because we have we have so much, you know, agroforestry stuff is potential. Mm -hmm. Actually, yeah. very exciting thing happened. I'm sure you knew about last year that Quilcha said that they weren't going to grow any more Sitka spruce. That they're now only going to grow like plant indigenous trees. So those things, like that's yeah. about, when I heard about that. I heard it from a friend while I was cycling in Wicklow with him and I was like, sorry, how do I not know this? And I told like everybody I know and nobody had even heard that it had happened as yeah. a thing. Do you know, it's kind of those yeah. those things that are actually happening out yeah. there that, you know, yeah. huge interests that we don't assume have any care for the planet. Well, I know Quilts are supposed to have care for the planet, but traditionally have, <laughs> have done some not great things, let's say. Yeah. But, it, but it's interesting. But you see shifts like that and you're like, oh my God, I mean, that's profound. Mm. And that's going to change the future for like grandchildren. We were thinking about it while we were driving up there. Like, imagine when you're in Wicklow in 80 years time when we're gone that will look like native woodland again like yeah, fully yeah. it's a re really lovely positive thought like no yeah. matter where, where the, the thought I suppose is to be doing stuff for not for us necessarily anymore but be thinking of as the generations collective. as a collective yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah we're really bad at thinking far in the future <laughs> yeah. are we though but, yeah. I know it's but shocking. like I also I mean I also sometimes think like why like why am I in this why do I like, why do I care? And I just, I think that it's, it's just, it's what, like, makes me happy as well. Like, it makes mm. me depressed. Yeah. But well, it makes me happy yeah. too. Like, it makes me happy to know that hopefully yeah. something will come of it. Yeah. Like, it's, 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 I just think it's actually probably the most important time to be alive, mm. really. Like, mm. we're at this real crossroads. We're at this actual tipping point. And we all can play a part in that and so it's just far more satisfying to me to be involved in this stuff because you like i get so much from it too because it's like yeah it's exciting to know that you have the chance to play a part yeah in actual change and maybe like i fail miserably but sure it's worth a shot like and you were living a purpose at the time you know and that purpose thing is what everybody knows these days that that's the thing that makes people live longer and all those crazy places in the blue zones as well it's like all about the icky guy and making sure you kind of like attach to something and then just run with it the icky icky guy i don't know that that's the it. you know the blue zones thing the so it's the this the study of these kind of areas in the world i talk about it all the time people are going to have heard this a million times sorry. but like it's sorry anyway you can switch off now and switch on again in a second um, <laughs> 
but um, so the like seven places in the world where people are living the longest so the most oh, okay. centenarians living there so there's like um, there's a place in Mexico there's a place in California there's a, one of the Greek islands there's yeah, uh, yeah. North Hokkaido in Japan and so they've looked at what the reasons are that they think they might be living so long and they've looked at you know their diet and their lifestyle and all sorts of stuff but actually yeah. they found the top of the tree thing was purpose ikigai oh. which they call it in, in, in Japanese they call it ikigai so oh. and then yeah. community right Community was the next one. Yeah, exactly. And, and nutrition's with, way and down with the list. this kind of, yeah, like you get both. You get community yeah. and you get purpose. Yeah, so exactly. Handy. There you go. <laughs> there we go. That's all you need. <laughs> but I, but it, is, it is hard though, because it is like, there's a lot of burnout as well. Yeah. With scientists and, it's and, 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 so. and when you feel that attached to something, you're like, we have to do something. It can be a really yeah. heavy thing yeah. to actually have to yeah. live with, to carry that the mm. whole time. Eh? Yeah. And it's never enough. You never yeah. think yeah. like, grand I've done it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah like you have to kind of like take time for yourself take time to chill out take time to kind of yeah. but that's also breaks. I think it comes back to that feeling of like well I have personal responsibility to do like to feel that weight on me mm. whereas the more we put that back out into like a com community based thing then you're not holding all that on your own yeah yeah you know? And it, you know we need to get away from that individual yeah. responsibility, don't we? Absolutely, yeah. Collective responsibility. It's a really good action, point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's all plant four hundred trees. Let's do it, <laughs> and we'll give a plug for that as well. We'll put that into show notes big yeah. time. That's great. That's a fantastic initiative. Cool. All right. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank great. you. It was lovely to finally do this. Yes, Thanks I know. For having yeah. me. Chat, if people want you. to find out more about your work, do you have like a website or a um, social media thingy? Yeah, I'm Laura J. Kyo, K E H O E, on Twitter. And I think on my Twitter, there's links to 400 Trees and my website and stuff like that. Brilliant. So maybe that's the easiest. That's perfect. Great. And we'll link that in the show notes as well. Nice. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much for listening, everybody. Thank you for thank watching. You. And please do help to keep this thing going if you can, keep the show on the road. If you've watched this far, you hopefully want more of it. Um, like, subscribe, comment underneath. Um, Please also visit our sponsors as well um, and give us reviews as well on, if you can on iTunes or whatever you're listening to this or watching it. Um, but yeah, our sponsors, so Clear Light Saunas, um, that fantastic infrared sauna thing, which is one of the best things you can do for your health and your family's health. Um, New Zest Nutrition, who make that fantastic pea protein that we all take, we all love. And again, if you want to support your family's health, getting good quality, undenatured, vegan, conscientiously grown protein into your diet is a really important thing. Uh, and also the swivel that this um, little podcast is filmed on and recorded on, which allows us to take it anywhere into the wilds of my back garden in this case. Um, but yeah, so please help support and um, thanks for watching. Thank you, everyone. Cheers, Bye. guys. Thank you.